We have some new people. Welcome. All right. We do have a lot of new people. So welcome to uh, MassFits, our monthly meeting. And hopefully, Ann, can it, can it, do you think everybody can see my screen? Is it sharing? Yep. All right. So today, <clears throat> the highlight of today, we're going to talk about, Brian Duke is going to talk about uh, how he restored his telescope. But before we begin, welcome all. And uh, is there anybody in the group? This is a very informal chat. Is there any anybody in the group who's been having trouble with any issues with their astrophotography? Yes, the sky keeps clouding up. <laughs> Quit buying stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so who's who's buying all this stuff? <laughs> all right. Sunita, did you get that uh that that working? That uh that... no. No. Yes, I mean not yet. So no. I I mean I also wanted to ask anybody if if there's anybody in the group that has kind of a small alignment tool that I'd be able to borrow just for the eclipse. But I'm also going to get up or I'm also going to do this manually, you know, because I mean the sun, it's not that hard, right? It's large and I just need to move the camera every five minutes or so. That's the, my other option. Right. Do you plan on taking video? No, not video, just, just images. Okay. I wonder if there's something you could 3D print that would hook onto your camera. Yes, like the little thing where you're able to see the sun through, right? Yeah, you would just so, hook up with a circle and maybe a something. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a handful of those um, 3D printed extra. So if you want one or anybody else wants one, I've got a couple of them sitting over on the shelf. I just printed a batch of four of them. Um, and I'm only using two of them, so yes, uh, I'd be glad be to great. let you have one. That would be great. Well, would Brent, I, be able, um, I mean, would I be able to mount it on the hot shoe of my camera, or does it have this Vixen style dovetail for? It it's got a Vixen style. Here, I'll grab it real quick and I'll show you. It's one of these. Let's see yes. if that goes, but it's just got a little Vixen shape on it, and then a the little pinhole on the other side but yeah i got a handful of these so if anybody does need one uh i'd be glad to set one out let them come get it okay sticky tape sticky tape will work on those too oh yeah velcro yep okay. that's Thanks a good idea. On, uh, my next shop job go make a couple of those <laughs> mine will be wooden though <laughs> <laughs> well if keith was here he would he's got a, a really high quality 3d printer and he could probably print one of those hot shoes on there. We'll talk to him okay. about that. But okay, uh, but Bruce and Keith are on the other side of the world. They're they're in Carrieville, and you're over there by the river, mm -hmm. right? Yes, but I can drive there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it'd be worth it. All right. Does anybody else have any other issues? Yeah. Um. So one thing that was going on uh, with Deep Sky Stagger, um, I was trying to uh, add my flats, but for some reason, like I could choose any of the flats, but it would only let me choose one. If I tried to add like two, um, uh, Deep Sky Stagger would crash. Does anybody know what was going on right there? Brent, you probably know more about Deep Sky Stagger than anybody I know. Have you run into that? So I have, um, and I can't remember what I did to fix it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm trying to recall. It's it's been a couple years, but I, I recall the issue that that you you're talking about. I want to say I just threw away like a, a batch of, of flats and darks and yeah. redid them, and and everything was fine. But I I don't know where it came from, and I don't know how I fixed it. Yeah. Was it a meta was it a metadata problem, Brent, or do you think it was just a corrupt? I, I mean, I might think it is, but like at the time, and and it's now been probably 
uh, a year and a half, two years since I've, I've been using Deep Sky, Sky Stacker. Um, like, I, I don't know what would have been different in my process that would have caused it. So that that's the only thing. Like, I didn't do anything differently. It just randomly showed up on one particular set. Uh, I banged my head against it for probably two weeks before I finally just gave up on it and moved on to the next thing. Um, I bet if you go, I look out on Deep Sky Stacker uh, Facebook somewhere, I, I feel like I posted about it once upon a time. I bet we could probably find it and dig it up. But again, I don't know that it had any answers. Okay. Well, if anybody runs into a solution, drop it in the Slack channel <clears throat> so Adam can get going. Yeah, I tried to start using Serial, but I just settled on just using one flat. And I'd say the one flat, you know, did uh, corrected like about 90% of the gradient uh, that I was seeing. Mm. So could you could you create a master flat and just use that? Could you just take all the flats, yeah. stack them up? Have you tried that? So so I'm kind of new to this. Sure. Uh, I had some I had master bias and master dark, but um, I don't know how to create uh, the master flat yet. Uh, when I was in Deep Sky Stacker, it created its own master off, uh, bias and master uh, um, dark. But uh, since uh, I hadn't been able to compile uh, a bunch of flats just one at a time, it wasn't creating a master flat, I guess. I'm not sure. Gotcha. Were you doing that in the context of you know, there was lights also added to the project, or did you try? Have you tried just doing the flats on their own? You know, I I, I didn't even think you could do that, so I didn't even try. I would just think it would just give me a message that said you have to have light, you have to add lights. Yeah. I was wondering if it was a memory issue, but yeah. I mean, it, it could be. I don't know, but is it normal? Like, and I also was converting all my flats because they're in they were they were in raw. Uh, and then I was converting uh, them to bits files. I, I guess you have to do that because that was the only way it would work. Well, well what kind of raw? CR2? Uh, any, uh, Nikon, uh, okay. NEF. Okay, that I don't know. I, I, I'm a Canon person, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, we could always try, like if you had a couple of them, we could throw them up on the, um, the Slack or a, a share someone yeah. else could try to stack them in like pix inside or something and see if it complains to and just see if it is the files versus deep sky yep <clears throat> and is it normal for all these files to be like because they're when they're in raw they're they're very small uh file size and then when i convert them to fits they become like huge gigantic is that normal <laughs> yeah oh, okay that is normal Hate to tell you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just I just started with all this stuff. Uh, wait, wait till you go to full frame. <laughs> Look at your file yeah. sizes. <laughs> okay, I just pulled up a, a deep sky run, and yeah, it creates a master flat for me based yeah. on the gain I was running. Yeah. So I, I would, I'm trying to create the master flat without the lights, and then just use yeah. that master flat. Yeah. Yep. And that might work because you said you got one flat to work with it, right? Yeah, I could get any of the flats to work with it, but if I tried to add like multiple, it wouldn't work. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, like I said, it was okay. It does. It did create. It. I don't know if it's an option to do that or not, but yeah. it did make one. So I had to go look. I couldn't remember. Okay. It's was there so anything else nowadays? I don't. I don't worry with it too much. I mean, it, it it rips through most of the images I have for an evening fairly quickly. You know, frame. You know, image by image. So Don, you use Deep Sky Stacker? Yeah. And and you never have you ever run into that where No. I've not run into that one. Um I've run into when it was really old and slow. Yeah. The old versions of it, but the new versions are just bunny quick. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, Bradley, go ahead. Uh what um, well, real quick. Real quick, what version of Deep Sky, Deep Sky Stacker are you using? Okay, hang on, you'd ask. <laughs> are you asking? Uh, no, Adam. Adam, what Adam. version are you using? Um, yeah. It's the, I, I just downloaded it and it should be the newest version because I've been downloading the, uh, trying to. 515 is what I have on the desktop, but. I don't even. Uh, Where'd you go? Deep Sky Stacker 515, yeah. Yep. 
So you've got the latest greatest. Well, as of a week or two ago. Yeah. You could probably try maybe a little bit older version and see if you have the same problem. Just do the flat if you have if it crashes on this one. Try like the one of the four versions and then put in just all your flats and just stack those together and see if it creates your master flat. That's worth a try. I, and then I you can go back there. to the five one with the master flats and all your other master stuff, put it all together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bradley, you're about ready to say something. Sure thing. I'm what I call a re-beginner. My last astrophotography venture was sheet film through a four and a half inch <laughs> Tasco reflector in 1968. That's the way to do it, man. Well. Yeah. Old school. <laughs> so I'm starting from scratch. I'm equipment free. I'm interested in photographing deep sky objects. And I'd like to listen to anyone with comments about what kind of equipment to buy. Uh, the best way in and so forth. Um, my budget's not drastically tight. I'd call it maybe four. Uh, so I'm ready to listen and taking notes. Well, the first thing I'd say, you need wide field. Uh, you want deep sky? Yep. That's where you start. So clearly wide field. Yeah, Got a suggested start. F number, Steve? Uh, what, what telescope, guys? To, to start, like a maybe William Optics? Something Optic. like a, we, uh, William Optics, maybe a, a 70 millimeter, um, yep. like a, a Zenith star or one of those kind of in that family, something in the probably 350 to 450 um, millimeter focal length range. I, I think that's a safe kind of restarting point. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. The scope I built, that was that 450, and that's the reason I built it, because I wanted something with that kind of field of view. Mm -hmm. so. John, you use a William Optics. Which one do you have? I got the uh, GT71. It's a triplet. It is native 420 millimeter, and I've got the uh, 0.8x reducer, which gives me down to 336. Do you use that so reducer does... quite a bit? Oh, that's oh, the Heart and Soul Nebula. That's a six panel mosaic using that scope. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it, it fits a lot of the a lot of the uh, nebulas fit in there pretty good, except for some of the really big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it could fit almost a whole soul in there by itself. It'd be cutting that edge off. Cause I got a 533 camera. If I had my DSLR in it, it'd probably fit almost the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my mine's the same size as as John's. Um, it's the one that I use most of all. Um, I've got a much bigger Explorer Scientific 127 one that's you know the big and impressive one so like whenever i talk to the kids at my kid's school or something like that they're they're always like i bet you're always using the big one i'm like i'm, I'm really not <laughs> so it's really made out of so, foam. <laughs> naive naive point all you guys are talking refractors yes oh yeah, yeah. okay you can get the you're reflectors right. you can get the reflectors when you're you, when you're in uh merrill's territory of 2000 i mean <laughs> well, you can you can get like a Newtonian or uh, you know like a six inch or eight inch. It's going to give you like an f four. It's going to get you in that you know similar range. Even if like an eight inch mirror, it might get down to the four hundred millimeter range. But that's something yeah. big out there on on it on it, and it come, becomes where if you get a little bit of gust of wind, you're going to get vibration. Whereas a little bitty refractor being in the seventy millimeter, eighty millimeter range, I mean, I could probably image stuff out in a hurricane, and it probably won't even move it. Because it's it's so small and tiny, the, the, so the wind just ignores it. But if, the bigger you get, the, it starts catching that wind, and you start getting vibrations, and your frustration level goes up, and then your curse words get worse, and you start making new words up as you go along. So it's you know start short, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a small smaller scope, so seven to eighty millimeter range, you know, for the, the aperture, and about you know three to four hundred millimeter range if you got a dslr and a, and a lens like a fixed lens 135 millimeter i mean you can capture a lot of bigger deep sky objects and get a really wider field of view and you can go up to sure. a 300 millimeter lens something like that you're gonna you might spend just as much i mean i spent a thousand on my gt71 um probably about 10 10 years ago i guess almost eight years ago uh -huh. so you if you can get a uh, like 200 millimeter lens or a 300 millimeter lens not the um 75 to 30, 300. I mean, something that's going to get you like a fixed focal length of uh, 300 millimeters. You're going to spend almost that much on a scope anyway. But if you already got the DSR to hook to it, you could use what you got and, and play with that. I don't. Um, 
I don't, so, and I, yeah, I don't particularly but, do any other photography. So I'd be glad to get uh, dedicated astronomical equipment on the back end. Yeah, I mean, but everybody I tell you, always uh, session. Um, if you go back in the the YouTube channel on the recordings of these sessions, and somebody with better memory than me might remember when it is, but I did uh, I did a presentation on exactly kind of the equipment that I bought, how long it took me to build up to where I currently am, and kind of the the order of things and upgrades that I did uh, along the way. Um, that one, there's a lot of people talking about equipment that they had and and the same order that they went and kind of how they built it up. I, I think that would be a really good one to go back and, and check out and just kind of see um, what people were talking about in that particular session. Okay, thank you, I'll do that. Any recommendations as to mounting? What do you got, Brent? So I Sorry? have the EQ6, um, the Skywatcher EQ6R, uh, which is a heck of a mount. Um, and John, so you have that too, don't you? No, I've got the the oh, one earlier model that I got a regular EQ6 before okay. the R model came out. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's solid. Um, there's some newer ones that are more lightweight that uh, I know some people uh, might have those the the ZWO harmonic drive um, that can handle I guess more weight and they're a lot more lightweight. Um, I'm still on the fence on it. I, I, I suspect I will eventually snag one of those, but the one I have now, it, it like I said, it, it's a workhorse. I, when I bought it, I bought it to make sure that I could use it for a long time, and I've had nothing but good yep. things to say about it. Yeah, so, his, I mean, his, let's bring it up a his good mountain. Point. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, his mountain do. Yeah, I'm sorry. His his mountain do what? 44, 45 pounds, or 40, yeah. 40 to 44 range. Mine's about the same, around 40 pounds. You, know, you look at if you can go buy a mount today. You got to look at what are you going to do in the in like the mid future, a few years down the road. What do you really want to try to get to? You want to do a lot of galaxies. You want to do just bigger nebulas. You want to do small nebulas. You want to do planetary nebulas. You want to looking at planets and stuff. You know, depends on that. That might drive you to where okay, if I get a small scope today, like a, a 70 millimeter or 80 millimeter, I can do a little bit more wider field, bigger of um, like heart and soul nebula stuff, uh, elephant trunk nebula. I can get the bigger stuff in a 30 um, amount that does 30 pound weight. Be perfect for. It's kind of a lightweight, easy to move in and out of the house. You know, you don't have a fixed spot to put it anywhere. If you're going to come in and out of the house with it, you know, by the time you get to an EQ6, I mean, that mounts and with everything to it, it gets heavier and heavier. So, you know, the, the right. closer you want to get the thing, the longer focal length you go, the bigger the mount you're going to need. And it's going to be, you start looking at weight, goes up. Weight goes Brother, up are you going to park it in your backyard? I'm sorry? Are you going to park the mount in your backyard or are you going to have to lug it around? Oh, I'm not parking it in the backyard. We don't have that kind of backyard, so I'll be <laughs> schlepping it out. To if you're schlepping yeah. it, I would, I would, uh, I would consider like an AM5. The, the yeah, brand do or AM5, brand. AM3, something. Like, go, I'd probably go more for a lightweight mount, something in the house. Because if you get a heavy mount, I mean, there are days with my EQ6, I like. Oh, I really want to do that? That thing is just too heavy. <laughs> I'll, I'll skip the whole night because I don't feel like dragging it out or anything like that. Or I'll put the my uh, single arm. <laughs> Uh, six SE mount, which is all the azimuth mount with uh, my little six uh, C six on it, basically, uh, with, and just go out there and do moon shots and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I can pick the whole thing, throw it out there, throw it down, do quick alignment, go to the moon, play around all I want. Uh, but if I want to yeah. do a galaxy with it, I got to have uh, the, you know, it doesn't do great because I got field rotation to deal with. Um, yeah, but yeah. that's why I'm, you look at if, if you're going to. I'm lusting yeah. after the the AM5. Um, I I don't need it <laughs> because of yeah. uh, what I've got right now. But uh, the mobility of it is what really is making me um, intrigued to to have it. Yeah. You know, I, I don't but, I don't leave the house too often uh, when I'm doing my stuff, but I, I certainly want to be able to do more of that. And I think those harmonic mounts are are a real good way to stay portable um, and not have to lug around. You know, this big 50 pound beast and, yeah, and bradley if, things get heavy bradley if you if uh, the beauty of the harmonic mounts is they really don't require uh counterweights sure whereas yeah, most, have, most of the other german equatorials you have to have the counterweights now if you get AM5. really heavy on these am5s you got to have a counterweight i have an am5 and it is great uh not having to deal with that counterweight uh you've got a, a carbon fiber uh tripod it sets on you can slip your arm under, pick it up, and, and go with it. It comes in its own case. Uh, 
use an ASI air with it, whatever uh, lens you want to with it. And it's, uh, it's great. It's been, the, it's, it, it's been, it cost a good bit to get into it, but it's been my best investment so far. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Final, of, final, bit. Yep. what, a lot of your what money, would you reckon? A lot of your money Sorry, go goes towards your mouth. Yeah, basically. of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, finally, um, I, I know that well, I've dealt with uh, shabby shaky mouse before and it doesn't matter what's going to put on it. crap if it has that. Final question, what would you guys recommend for a beginner person in a dedicated astronomical camera? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Zoe guy, Brent's a Microsoft guy. It just, it just depends what you're comfortable with. Yeah. If you're I mean, Zoe, I, you I do, think, yeah. Yeah. I think the, the ZWO, um, probably color cameras I don't, I don't know if you want to jump straight to mono and and kind of deal with all the mess that goes along with that just yet but um i started out on a canon uh i moved up to uh an, a zwo asi 071 mc mm -hmm. um i think that is a great kind of intro color camera uh i think steve i think you have that have or had that one i think a few other peoples have had that one right um so i i did that for a few years before finally shifting over and, and doing mono uh imaging uh, but if you're kind of getting back into it getting comfortable with it uh, I, I i'd say it's hard to go wrong with the zwo color uh camera yeah do the one shot and I th the 071 i don't know if you can even find that anymore yeah uh, i think the 2600 is pretty much replaced that one because the uh um, yeah, not, it's that's not the full frame. It's yeah. the, uh, the, uh, the DSLR sensor size. Where I started, with, I got a Canon T3i I modded and used that for a while. Then I moved my first, well, my only cool color camera is I got a, I got the ZWO 533, which is a square sensor. I was it's say, 3008 yeah. by 3008. And so it's smaller than the DSLR sensor, but I don't have to worry about having a big rectangle of how I want to frame things. It's going to be a square. I mean, I'm, you know, fit, you know, 45 degrees either way, and I got it in wherever I want. But I just leave it square the way it is on there and go out there and just deal with it. If I want to do it, I just maybe add a little extra mosaic second part to it if I have to. But most of the stuff fits in there perfectly well. And it's you know, it's, it's a lot cheaper being a smaller sensor. Um, you, I mean, I think the uh, 2600s right around $1,700. And the 533 yeah. is around around $900, $800, yeah, I think it is. Eight, you can eight, get them on sale. Last I saw. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hey, John, how, much right that, there. how much is that new one that has the extra chip for guiding? The one that's the the, the, the duo, which is the 2600 with the uh, it's got the mono uh, guider, and that's 2000. And so they brought the 2600 down to 1700, and then when they added the extra sensor, they made it 2000. And if you're going to do one shot color with it and no filters, uh, or you know, other than maybe just a uh, light pollution filter or um, I, UV IR tech filter, it'll work great. The problem with the, that sensor, the way it is, since if you start using, like I have an Anflia uh, five millimeter dual HA03 filter for my one shot color. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been having problems with the, um, like the, even like the uh, ultimate, the um, extreme, L extreme from the uh, Optolong, because the guide camera is shooting through the same filter and a lot of times they can't get guide stars so you have to go with longer exposure on the guide camera oh, wow. and even then they're having problems with it so they, there's people are starting to not like it that way i didn't i didn't think about it. that but it makes sense yeah, but if yeah you're using that, for, that's you're what like, made me leery about when i saw them yeah. coming out i was like uh it's intriguing but, i'm not sure if it's functional yet it's <laughs> but yeah i mean if you're going to use a uvir cut filter if you're going to use like the L, i use a uh, long l pro filter i've got an optinon Optolong L Enhance filter doesn't work fine with it, but I don't think my antlion is going to work that well with it because I'm going to need a longer exposure uh, to get better stars and stuff like that. Plus, you're still on the edge like you are with a uh, taking it off on a prism with a um, what is it? <laughs> I can't even think of it. The um, OAG? Off, off axis guider. Yeah, the off axis guider. Whereas off axis guider gives you the, the thing where you're going to put the filters behind it. So now right. you got your camera going to the filters, then going to your off axis guider. So your guide camera is in front of all your filters and you never have that problem. But when the, the guide camera is built into your main camera, it's going to go through all the filters that you put in front of it. And there's no yeah. avoiding it. So, wow. Yeah. I, I, that's, 
I, I just didn't think about that. So, I, it, Bradley, uh, uh, they brought up another point. You're going to have to invest in, we're in Memphis, Tennessee, really bad skies. Uh, and the only way to get some of these nebulas with an L enhanced or an L extreme filter uh, as well. And that, that, what are those, like 300 bucks? I forget. Uh, I mean, you get in the uh, mid twos. Yeah, new probably mid two. Um, go out okay. to cloudy nights; they're probably a, a hundred fifty for the the solid okay. ones at this point used. Yeah, so if you're shooting like the Orion Nebula and all that, it really pops yeah. with those filters. Whereas if you don't have anything at all, it's just it's gone. It's wash. It's washed out because the light pollution. Looks like the yeah. L Extreme new is three oh nine about. Yeah. <laughs> And the ant yeah. is about 380. Yeah. The the back one I got right now on my screen right here, that's the Heart and Soul Nebula. And that was done with the Antlia uh, HA03 combo filter for my one-shot colors. And <laughs> so that brings out a lot more of the nebulosity and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And then I've got where I've got this here is the same <laughs> thing. This is the Thor Summit with the same filter. But then I go to my L Pro filter with for M51 here for the Galaxy. And if mm -hmm. I don't, now I'll use a UVR cut filter to get Jupiter, so. But to bring out more detail, you gotta have the filter for a whole lot longer exposure. My DSLR couldn't even bring this out, even though it was, it was I modded it with, I took out the L2 filter on it, so it opened up the uh, spectrum to get the more red, and they couldn't bring this out. Whereas my 533, this is a four panel one, the 533 brings it out with that, uh, with the Antley filter. And I love the Antley filter, so I just keep on using that all the time. Yeah. Thank you for the advice on filters. I come from the mountain west of Canada, and when I came here, I was appalled to see how dreadful the skies are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Make you want to go back. Huh? If you go to Astro Flats, you can, you can actually shoot galaxies there and without filters. That, that, that's how good the skies are. All right. Does anybody else have anything to add? Or anything, or does anybody have any problems? All right. I think we're going to have Brian Duke come up to the plate. And uh, I tell you, these FedEx pilots I'm discovering, <laughs> they they just tinker and everything. It must be because of all that time in the tarmac, right, Brian? We have too much time on our hands. So that's what it is. <laughs> okay. So hey, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Certainly, sure. John. Okay. The other day, I installed a um, ZWO AEF on my uh, Celestron 8SC SET, mm -hmm. and I pull and I'm getting to set up to do the uh, the eclipse, and I pulled it off to take my uh, telescope out to the uh, Mississippi, uh, out to uh, Marietta, and when I got there, the thing will not focus now. Uh, I put everything back in place. I thought. But the focus still works, but it's like it'll focus things that are fairly close. But when I point it to deep space and try to, and well, if I try to focus on Jupiter, it will not focus. But I found that if I was focusing on something like went through the branches of a tree, I can focus on the tree. How far away was the tree? Uh, the tree was, I don't know, 100, 150 feet away. Okay. And uh, it would be farther than that. Yeah. yeah you want to, if you focus on a tree, you want to focus on the tree furthest away from you. That's a good place to start. Right. Then, right. But uh, yeah. I have, I've gone from it. It absolutely won't even begin to focus on a, you know, on a, on a, uh, on a distant object. Like I said, I tried Jupiter because it was, uh, of course, that's one you can, you'll find very easily. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I've, I've pushed something out of alignment with my focusing. Uh, knob, I know you've got to uh, put a keeper on there to keep anything from sliding back out of the back of your telescope. Right. I've got a ring in there, and I didn't know if there was some other adjustment in there uh, that I've accidentally turned or that I got in place that when I was working with the EAF that it turned an adjustment like a, a screw or something back up in the shaft of that uh, uh, adjusting knob. It's possible. Normal. It's possible you damage something in the focus area of the. This um, is a SCT. Uh, I know with my my C six my six SC I um 
I just put on a, a, a belt drive for it, basically. And, yeah, I didn't discover those till I got into that, but I'm yeah, and go and, ahead. So I mean, it it works no problem, and I did notice that the 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 stem that it's really moving in and out the whole bring the whole mirror back and forth. There's a screw in there to hold that. If the screw comes out, then the stem will slide out, and then it's not going to move anymore. You can focus all day, but it won't slide it back and forth anymore. And okay. I, when I when I change my focus on my nine and a quarter, I change off the stock focus and I put in a feather touch fo uh, focuser. And I took that all apart. I mean, you see, you I had, to, I had to unscrew it to get the old one out and put the new one on. I had to put the screw back in. Otherwise, once you move that mirror forward, you try to bring it back. It's not coming back. It, it helps keep that thing stable, so it'll, it'll actually help grab it back and forth. Okay, one thing I did. I want to check. Yeah, one, yeah so I, check to see if you get that center screw on there. Yeah, no, the one thing when I turned the the uh, adjuster all the way in one way that there was a pin or something that stuck out the end of the uh, of the adjuster that I had not seen before. And I didn't know if that was something that was not supposed to be there, supposed to be there, that had slid out of position, or if it was an adjuster that had screwed back. Uh, it's just, uh, it's got me confounded. And the problem is it's got me scared because that's the telescope I was going to use for the eclipse. And I've got almost no time to get that thing repaired if it needs to be repaired or find out what I have done to it. I would pull the focuser off of it. Just just yank it, yank the focuser off and manually focus and see if that, that plate is going in and out. Looking through the hole. Don't put an eyepiece in there or anything. Okay, how do you do you, that? How do you take you it? You can apart? look in the what you can do is if you got the way it is right now, look in the front through the front of your scope and then move the focuser back and forth. You should see the mirror moving back and forth. Okay. If the mover if the mirror's not moving at all, it has come unattached from your focuser part, which okay. means you pull the little rubber knob off. And you yeah. can look in there and see if there should be like a little hole that a screw would go in there. The mirror, okay, hold the, it in this place. Yeah, the mirror is moving because I can I can cause it to focus and unfocus. Like I said, when I was looking at some near objects, okay. so it's moving, but I don't know you know why it's not. Uh, I mean, I'm not even getting the little donuts that you see when you look at a very bright object through the telescope, and it's not focused. Do you go to the very end of the travel of it on both ways? I go to the travel both ways, and I'm not getting anything. Oh, imagine you see more spacers. If, do you got a focal reducer on it? No. Uh, no, I don't know what matter. I, would, I, yeah, um, I was wondering, did I do something to change the focal length on the dog on thing? The um, what you could do, I mean, you're are you looking through an eyepiece on it, or a camera yeah, through it? I've got a right angle eyepiece on it. Okay, because um, usually with the camera, you'd have to up the gain and stuff. So when you start focusing, you might start to see a fuzzy donut mm -hmm. starting to show right. up, and it'll get brighter right. and brighter and brighter. Right. But since you got the eyepiece on there, you should be the same thing. You should start right. to like fade yeah. in to have a, have a donut. It okay. might be to where if you're going too fast, you might be going past it too quick. Well, um, I don't think that. But I mean, I've had way. I've had frustrations like you with my little six uh, six uh, see, I'll, I'll go out there and I'll, I and I had the eyepiece on a long time ago. I'd focus on the can't find. I'd run to the very end. It's it won't go any further. Let me go the other way. And okay. I won't find it. It's like, am I missing some? I blink third or what? Then I have okay. to go real slow and just you know calm down and oh there it is. Or I might be off. Okay. From where my guide scope and the main scope is not, my guide scope is pointing at a star, but the main scope yeah. is off, so you're not seeing those stars at all. Yeah. Okay. So you might have to. The other thing you can do with you, with, with here's what you can do: if when the moon comes out, pull right. your eyepiece off, look through where your eyepiece would go, yeah, and just look through there and move the scope mainly until you see almost blinded by the moon. Yeah. Then put your eyepiece on, then try to focus yeah. that way. When I, when I tried it out, the moon was now. But anyway, I just want to throw that out there, see what y'all had to say, and uh, I've been out of. I've been away, and uh, I'm going to get out there probably tomorrow night sometime, and, well, when the sky clears again. So I just want to get some input from y'all before I get out there and start struggling with things. I appreciate your input. Yeah, Freddie Diaz has that set up, too, and I bet he's ran into that problem. Okay. I, I post something on Slack. I post this question on Slack as well. Okay. I appreciate it, Steve. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I think we're ready for the Brian Duke <laughs> to join. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here. I don't know about the anything, but okay. I'm gonna quit sharing, Brian. All right. And uh, you just do your thing. Let's see what we have. All right. What do you have? Do you see? Uh, That's ooh. perfect. You see this? Yep. All right. Great. Uh, I'm Brian. If I haven't met uh, any of you, but um, so it, 
Merrill invited me to, to talk about some of the work I've been doing. This has been a project over kind of the fall. Uh, I've, I've been enjoying the work I've done the last couple of months. But um, the big picture here is you can take an old and busted mount that you're ready to throw in the trash can and turn it into something that's really great to image with. So um, I did that with a Celestron C gem. So that's what this is about. Um, but you could you could modify, use the same process to modify um, any existing mount you have. So um, it could be a mount that, you know, the, the electronics aren't working anymore. It could be a mount that doesn't have go-to capability in the first place, but maybe has a tracking motor. Um, and people have even done this to to mounts that don't have any any uh, motors at all. So you could you could modify kind of anything if you're if you're up for it. Um, the big power in in uh, in this process, I think, and I wish I would have known this uh, a long time ago. But this is a, this is a fairly new thing. But um, is you could take a mount, like say you buy an old uh, Los Mandy or a or like a CGE Pro is a really common one to do with either no or broken electronics, and you can completely revive the thing. So um, you can get, for example, a CGE Pro for uh, under a thousand bucks that's broken, and then you can spend a couple hundred bucks more and completely rebuild the thing and have a, you know an awesome mount that has a ton of capability. So that's what this is about. Um, for me, this started, uh, I have this Celestron C gem, like I talked about, I've owned it about 15 years, I bought it new maybe five to eight years ago, um, it stopped intermittently, it would stop tracking in RA. So when you're doing imaging and you it just all of a sudden randomly decides to stop, it ruins your pictures, right? So back then I talked to Celestron and they said, oh, no big deal. It's your uh, control board. Just buy another one of these, slop it in, everything will be great. So that's what I did. Um, that lasted until this fall. And then it started to have, have the same kind of issue. So uh, this is a picture from I, I don't know, August, I think. Um, and you can see it looks like, you know, part of it's okay. And then it would just, it would just stop. So it would stop tracking uh, no matter what I did. And, and you know, I'd have to reboot it or let it cool down or whatever to get the mount going again. Um, so obviously this doesn't work. Over about two a two month period, this got so bad that the mount was unusable and I gave up. And then I started looking at at what to do. So uh, here's the here's the offending mount. Um, so I'm going to fix it. Right. So I, I thought about buying something new, but you know, everybody has a budget. Um, and so I looked at, let's just fix it. So the kind of the two options are go back to Celestron, buy another control board. Um, cause I, you know, it was the same thing, exactly the same thing, um, that was happening before, uh, the, the Celestron control board is about 300 bucks. Um, and that would fix the problem. But then what that would get me back to is a mount that's 15 years old. So this, you know, 15 years ago, if you weren't imaging, then everything was done over serial ports. If you wanted to talk to your mount with a computer, you had to hook in a, you know, a phone cord in the bottom of your handset, have a USB to serial jumper, you know, all, all kinds of fun to even talk to this thing. So, um, so I, I did a little bit more research and, and started digging and found what I thought was some really cool stuff. So the first thing I saw was a YouTube video of some guy that had taken a C gem and he had modified it to have belt, a belt drive. So uh, from the motor to the worm gear assembly, he had changed it to be a, a belt drive instead of the, you know, the multi-gear, highly sloppy uh, kind of setup that the C Gym has. Um, so I thought that was really cool, but he was one of those, well, I'm not going to put, uh, anyway, I, I'm not going to be mean, but he didn't share any details. How about that? Um, <laughs> so I kept digging, um, and then I found this, this, uh, this online open source project called OnStep. And OnStep is a, is a, like I said, it's an open source project started by a guy named Howard um, Dutton, I think is his last name. And he bought uh, a, a Lost Mandy mount that he wanted to add go-to capability for. And so he started software to do it. So he figured all that out. Um, it's a super active community. Uh, they have an online group. They have uh, development just goes nonstop with the stuff. So it's it's really great to see. Um, lots of people wrote. You know, they have a they have a wiki there that lists you know a bunch of people that have done uh, an on step mod to their mount. And there's all kinds of people bragging about they took a totally dead mount and made it awesome for a hundred bucks. Um, so I thought that was pretty great, right? Right. Um, obviously it takes some time, but, uh, like Steve already jabbed time is free for FedEx pilots, apparently. So, um, 
but anyway, so so <laughs> I, I I kept researching and decided to go to go down that route. So I'm going to gut the thing and do all new electronics. Uh, the thing they say though is, hey, if you're going to tear apart the mount, to change out the motors, to change out the gears, when you're in there, you might as well fix stuff that's wrong, right? So uh, I started to do a little bit of research on that, and then I learned uh, or relearned rather about hypertuning. Um, hypertuning is is essentially just going through your mount and doing an overhaul. So fixing everything that's wrong, polishing up. This is, you know, a couple of the uh, parts of the worm gears where the, uh, you know, you can see the the one on the left there is is as I pulled it out and then I cleaned it up, polished it up a little bit. Um, and then that's the other one on the right. So you're kind of doing this kind of thing to all the things that matter in the mount um, and, and overall just trying to make it better. So hypertune is actually... Um, it's a it's a trademarked name for this making your mount better. So the goal here is just to make an existing mount as good as you can be. Um, Deep Safe Products is the company that owns um, that trademark. So you can obviously fix your mount however you want, and you don't have to you know pay anybody to do it necessarily. But um, Deep Safe Products has some great videos for different mounts, and they have a video for the C Gem. Uh, and it's actually two videos about an hour, hour and a half long each, and it goes through every single screw, every single adjustment, everything you're going to do. Um, and I thought it was really, really worth it to buy those. Um, the videos, I think, were 40-ish bucks. And then he has some, uh, he has a special tool that I bought, which was maybe 10 or 15 bucks more. And then I bought some spacers from him and everything else I either had already or I, I bought from, you know, Amazon or somebody online. So, um so the videos were key in doing that. There's a good, there's actually a great guide for the EQ6, which is a really similar mount anyway, but there's one for that already online that you can look up. And I think they call their super tuning, but it's anyway, it's almost exactly the same mount. So it's, it's really similar process. Um, but basically you, you pull the whole thing apart, you disassemble everything, you find problems. And a lot of these mounts, you know, kind of the mass produced mounts, there are issues uh, in the initial casting of parts, initial machining, some of the gears may, you know, be rubbing. Like for example, I had I had a couple of, uh, in fact, the gear pictured was was rubbing a little bit of the uh, assembly it was in. So that doesn't help, right? Um, so you can clean things up, uh, make it better. Um, basically, if there's any issues, you fix them. Um, I took the opportunity to replace some of the bearings inside. So I have ceramic bearings uh, replaced some of those, and I just bought those. I mean, I just bought them straight from the manufacturer of the bearings that, you know, it's nobody special. You can look up the size for whatever mount you have. And once you disassemble it, you can see the bearings and, and figure it out yourself too. Um, I did buy the Teflon spacers from D Deep Space Products. And those are, um, well, let's see if you can see my, oh, uh, you can't see my pointer. Um, anyway, they go in the stack of all the gears. So that just helps it slide better as it rotates, um, just to make sure there's no no friction, that kind of thing. All of the old stock grease um, gets yanked out and cleaned off. And then uh, the Deep Space Products guy recommends Super Lube, which is what I use. And that it seems to be working really, really great. So this is what the CGM looked like after I got it all taken apart. Uh, this is before I really did any work on it. So this is kind of the exploded view, if you will, of what uh, a CGM looks like. And it's really similar. Most, most mounts are pretty similar to each other. Um, and like I said, the goal is really just to take all these parts, figure out what's wrong and make them as, you know, make it as good as it can be. So in doing that, um, all kinds of people report, you know, Hey, it's easier to move. It's easier to turn. And I, I didn't expect, you know, I, I had a, a decently performing mount before, so I didn't, I didn't expect it to be night and day. However, I had no idea how good it would be. Um, I did visit Merrill's, uh, house. I brought my kids over there to, to see his observatory and you know when he unlocked his mount he was able to just kind of push it and the you know the you know his million dollar telescope would move and, and it was gorgeous right um but that's how mine moves now so this is this is the status of how things move it is it is smooth as butter <laughs> um it really is great and, and honestly the the best word that i or the word that i kind of used initially to describe it is the mount feels floaty now so if you if you un unlock the clutches and it's balanced. You can touch it, and the whole mount just it just goes. It's it's really amazing how uh, how different it is compared to before. But the the big win with that is that it makes balancing super super easy. So if you move if you move the weight just a tiny bit, you can feel the difference. And if you move it a tiny bit more, it'll start to move. Whereas, you know, it seemed like I had to move my counterweights an inch before before the 
you know, the whole thing would start to move. So that was, that's kind of the, the, uh, the big picture on the hypertune process. It worked really, really well. Um, and it, it feels great to have a mouth that just moves, uh, like a nice, you know, well-oiled machine, if you will. So, uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the hardware part of it, the software part, uh, and the electronics was the other side. So on step, we talked about it a little bit, but on step is this open source, um, open source project. And it's basically new firmware, new software that runs a telescope. Uh, and the cool thing is you can, you completely gut anything you have in your telescope. So I removed the mount or the, uh, I'm sorry, all the, the motors, the encoders, the, uh, the motor encoders, um, the mounts for the motors, the electronic board, all the wiring, everything. And I was left with just the hulk of, of the mount shell. And then everything that I put back in is new. Um, the cool thing with one of the cool things with OnStep is you you get to decide what it's going to do. So you you can pick you pick all the parts, right? So and depending on what parts you pick, can change how much uh, how much features it has um, and what which features you have. So one of the things I really wanted was uh, to move to stepper motors with belt drives. So I got that. Um, you can add GPS. This is a this isn't a list of all the things I did necessarily, but I did a bunch of these. Um, GPS is super easy to add, so that lets you do things like not only know where you are if you move your mount, but it also helps sync the time. So it automatically syncs the time and then gives a time pulse to your mount to make sure that time never drifts uh, in your mount's computer. So that helps with uh, the tracking solution, right, or the tracking rate. Um, I wanted Wi-Fi on mine, so I added that, and that lets me uh, connect with a, a phone straight to the to the uh, to the telescope. So I can do diagnostics, do setup, or even run it straight from the phone, which is cool. Um, I, I added an integrated weather station. So that lets me control. The next line there is automatic dew heaters. So now I just, uh, those just operate on, uh, through Nina is what I use with uh, ASCOM. And I just turn them to on and I have some settings that are already set in the background. And it just detects the weather local to my telescope and sets the dew heaters automatically to the heat that is required to keep the dew off, which is pretty cool. I didn't do um, the rest of these yet, but uh, things you can do is you can have encoders. So if you want to go buy, you know, super expensive wrench on coders or, you know, whatever floats your boat, you can add those. And there are people that have done done that and, and made amazing, you know, tracking uh, scopes or mounts do they, rather. Do they with, put those uh, on both axes, Brian? Things so like you could do it either way. RA is the one you really, really need it on, right? Not really, really need it's the wrong word, but um, if you're going to do one, it'd be RA. Um, and, you know, my initial thought, like, so I thought about going down this road eventually, but what I've seen, and I'll, I'll get to the rest of this later, but if you do a great polar alignment, um, you don't need anything on your deck axis, right? Um, cause it never moves. Um, but if you, um, if you, you know, if you need it, if you're going to track and deck too, um, or if you have a mount that is not a, an equatorial mount, then I would definitely put it on both if you're going to do an encoder. Um, but I, again, I haven't, I haven't been down the encoder road, so I'm not a pro on that. I know that you can do it with on step and I know that the results that some of the people have gotten are really impressive. And there's actually a company that makes mounts that uses on step and they have encoders on theirs. So it's it's uh, it's definitely a, a possibility. Well, Merrill got rid of his guide camera when he got his encoder going. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's incredible, right? Um, so OnStep can also control, you know, this other stuff. Control a rotator if you have that, um, which would work great if you, you know, specifically if you didn't have um, an equatorial mount and you wanted a rotator to fix the rotation of your camera, you could have that already linked and it's it's going to just take care of it um it can talk to your focuser um my, i still use an ancient robo focus which is older than my c gem mount even i think um and I, I haven't set this up yet but it could control that um if you wanted to um you can have a flat panel control you can put in you know all the sensors you care to put in um in addition to the encoders one of the things that um, that I've been looking at doing is for the, and I haven't done this yet, is you can actually use a little MIMS gyro um, and accelerometer to sense the orientation of your mount, and that can can uh, potentially work for all of those sensors in one. So you could have your home park limit sensors. Uh, it wouldn't work for PEC necessarily, but 
Um, but a, you know, a little bitty gyro accelerometer, you could you could solve all those issues with one, which is kind of neat. And, and OnStep can do all that. Um, as part of OnStep, um, Howard has developed um, a piece of software called Sky Planetarium, which is kind of his um, planetarium, uh, you know, software. So like Sky Safari or any of those. But one of the cool features that he just added, and he's super active at, at adding new features, is somebody said, hey, you know, it'd be really cool if we could just hit a button and, and go and the mount just moves around and develops a pointing model. And uh, so so this other guy, it's an, it's an open source community. So this other guy started down the road and then one day Howard just posted, hey, I just did it, it's done. Um, so you can you can put in you know, your sky in the back background where all your obstacles are literally hit go and it will it will sit there and plate solve and point uh, throughout the sky, however many points you do. And it'll it'll set up a pointing model if you want to do that. Uh, there's new features all the time. So that's that's uh, it's impressive to see it go. And they they add new boards all the time, new control boards, that kind of stuff. So um, so that's uh, kind of the overview for my specific stuff. Um, I. I wanted to go, like I said, with belt belt drive. You can see the belt there in the top, kind of top left of that photo. Um, so the stepper motor goes on the other end of that belt. I wanted um, the highest reduction ratio I could get. So I went with the five to one gear ratio from the stepper motor to that uh, worm shaft there. Um, so it's a it's twelve teeth on on the stepper motor and sixty on the other. Um, I knew, however, that that 60 tooth gear was bigger than the c gym casing so i did a little machining and by machining i mean i took a die grinder and just hacked it away until it fit um and that worked really well um it, you know i'm using the existing 180 to one worm gear every mount has a different you know a different ratio but i stuck with the same one because i don't have the capability to make something better <laughs> um for stepper motors, I went with NEMA 17 motors, which is pretty common for most most sizes of, of uh, telescope mounts. Um, you do want to go with the smaller 0.9 degree per step. And then for my specific case, I decided to go with 32 micro steps. Um, if you're not familiar with 3D printers or stepper motors or that kind of thing, you can each step of a stepper motor moves a certain amount. And these motors move 0.9 degrees uh, per step. But you can actually command sub steps, if you will. They call those micro steps. Um, and there's a there's a trade off in the number of micro steps versus the torque output of the motor. So you don't want to go any higher micro steps than you need. So what I did is I looked at what are the recommended, you know, uh, micro steps per arc second. Uh, and everybody says if you're going to, uh, not everybody says, but it's it it was pretty common to see if you're going to uh, do astrophotography, you want somewhere less than 0.28 arc seconds per micro step uh, for kind of the, the medium focal lengths, like thousand focal lengths where I, where I typically image. Um, so I went on the other side of that. So I went to 0.11 arc seconds per micro step. I did the math last night. I didn't know actually how chunky that would be in the motion, but it turns out, um, you know, 15 degrees an hour and you multiply by 3,600 divided by 3,600, then you take the, you know, 0.11, you end up with, uh, 136 micro steps a second. So it's actually stepping pretty quickly um, on the stepper motor itself. So that's that's kind of what that that's what that looks like. The stepper motor installed. So this is uh, part of the you know the frame of my mount on the right here. I chose stepper online motors uh, partly because I've used them before on 3D printer builds I've done, but they're also pretty popular as far as uh, price per performance uh, type of uh, stepper motors. They're not the best. They're definitely not the worst. And the, and the price is pretty fair. And, and a lot of times you can get them on Amazon and in two days, which is great. Um, a lot of, or all the parts I used, uh, for mounting. So the mounting of the electronics and mounting of the, of the, uh, motors are 3d printed. I took in all cases, I took designs that other people had already done for this mount. And then I modified them. So I, I, imported them into Fusion, and I basically started over, but I used their first one, their first set as a guide. I did that just to, to fine tune the alignment on things and to make sure that, you know, everything worked exactly for my setup. Um, I, I have all I have all these files online that anybody can have, so uh, I'll tell you where the link is later. But the big picture here, though, or the thing to watch out for is 
You don't want to use PLA or any other low temp material if you're doing things like a motor mount, because uh, if the motor gets hung up or you're out of balance, the motor warms up, or maybe it's just hot outside, you don't want the mounts to get melty because uh, then things aren't aligned and that's good. If you are uh, cool like Keith and you've got a, you know, a, a router, CNC router, then you could make the stuff out of aluminum, which would be even better. Uh, you could send off to have it done too, but 3D printing is easy and cheap. And I have one, so that's what I used. So here's here's the lowdown of my electronics. Um, I chose a Fisect or however you say that S6 control board. And again, this is right out of a 3D printer. So this is a 3D printer control board. Uh, it cost about 40 bucks, um, and that's on the expensive side of those. Um, I chose that one because it was kind of the new hotness at the time when when everybody was uh, on the OnStep forum or group was talking about this, and it has enough. Uh, you know, ins and outs and has enough uh, things like, um, uh, what's a good word for it? Well, it has extruder outs, you know, bed heat outputs that that will work for other features that I wanted. So it has all the features I wanted. Um, I decided to kind of go overkill on the stepper drivers. So stepper drivers are what convert um, the software signal to the actual motion of a stepper motor. Um, and they're in the top right of that photo. I went with their TMC 5160 uh, HV stepper drivers. And one of the reasons I went with those is they're way over spec for what I need, which means I shouldn't ever have a cooling problem. So I don't need a fan in here to keep this thing cool. I don't need any, don't have any concerns about it being hot. So um, it cost a little more to go that way, but um, I just figured peace of mind and why not hit it with a giant sledgehammer? Um, like I said, I use a GPS. Um, that's in there. It's the little thing on the right-hand side uh, that has the hot glue and the little gray wires going to it. Um, and the antenna, I just hot glued on the left side because that was the up pointing side of the uh, of where I'm going to mount this uh, up, at least when the, the telescope is parked. Um, I added um, a the Wi-Fi capability, which is that little blue board on the top, and that lets you have a website. So your your telescope launches a website. You can do all the configuration and everything uh, straight from your computer browser. Super easy. Um, like I said, I added a weather sensor, and that lets me do those two dew heater outputs. There's a couple other ways to do dew heaters. You can actually do them uh, very similar to what a lot of people have, where they just have a knob that they turn, you know, and they go, oh, well, I know if I go 50%, I'm good to go. You can set up an analog a do heater control or an on off if you want to do that. I thought it would be cool to automate it a little more. And the weather sensor was like eight bucks. So why not? Right. Um, if you're wondering how to control this, you can you can actually control it. I haven't done this, but but from what I understand, you can control it over uh, Wi-Fi if you want to. I prefer a hard line uh, USB and that's what I do. I use ASCOM, ASCOM drivers, and it works like a champ with Nina. And I assume it works great with anything else that uh, we'll use either ASCOM or Indy. So uh, like Steve said, when you're, a, when you're a pilot and you're traveling around, you got to get testing done. So this was uh, up in Baltimore. I did all my GPS and Wi-Fi testing outside of the hotel, just in some park. So I, uh, I you know, try to get stuff done during this project when I, when I could. The, um, the cool thing, though, was once I put all these pieces together, got it all together, um, the the first motion so not a first light but the first motion had a pretty it was a pretty special feeling so here's here is that i hope you can hear that so that's what it sounds like when it moves that's not operating like a uh celestron mount that is really smooth <laughs> it's really yeah it smooth. sounds totally different right it's not all all uh grindy I don't hear sound that. <laughs> no that's gone Mm -hmm. Now you could, so this is kind of a, a, a digression, but you could actually command it faster than the stepper motors can move. And then you'll run into, you know, stalling of stepper motors, that kind of thing. So that's something you have to watch out for. I mean, you can't just command it at 30 degrees a second, right? You have to, you know, normal slew rates are kind of typical, but um, anyway, but that's what it sounds like. So it was really great to, to see it move finally. And that was, that was kind of a big step. I only kind of worked on this, you know, 10, 20 minutes a night, um, you know, spread over quite a while, but um, eventually it was great to see it move. Before I, I got it out in the field, though, like I said, I added a weather sensor. So that's this bump on the outside of the case. This orange, big orange case is what I where I housed all my electronics. Um, 
and I decided to do mine on the outside of the mount, mostly to make it super easy for wiring and accessibility and that kind of thing. This hardware, all the electronics will actually fit inside the CGEM mount. Uh, and there's other people that have done it. So um, I just thought this would be easy and I don't care if there's a wart on the side of my telescope. Um, so that's where that is. The, all the electronics are in that big box and all the connections. The little uh, thing with the slots in it is the weather station. So what you can't do is put your weather sensor inside your telescope mount, right? Um, Cause I don't really care what the humidity is inside my mount or the temperature. I, you know, I really care where it is at the lens, right? If I'm controlling, uh, the dew heaters and and just want to know what it looks like. So, um, so I, I modified something on printables and and posted that, uh, or and then printed that. So it's on there. The the stuff on the right is is what my telescope's web page looks like when looking at the weather the weather sensor. So it gives you all the standard weather info. This weather sensor I'm using. Um, the big things you want are the temperature and dew point, or the temperature and the humidity, and then it calculates from that how 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 turned up you want the uh, dew heater. So that's kind of how that's used. Um, all right, so there ends the electronics build. So that was that was, uh, that was was initially the big goal was to get this thing working again, get it out under the stars and start using it. But, you know, if you're gonna do work on your telescope, you might as well do more work. So I, um, so one of the things I've, I've wanted forever is an observatory, right, in my backyard. So who doesn't want that? Um, so I went down the road of what do I do to put a dome in my backyard? Um, I, I talked to Merrill about it and, and out by Astro Flats, there was somebody else that had a dome in their front yard. He, I think he or somebody else here um, stopped by and knocked on their door and said, hey, do you know astronomy? And and it turns out that it was for sale. They were trying to get rid of it. Um, so I went, I uh, pursued uh, picking that up and putting it in the backyard. Um, I got to the point where I talked to my HOA. Sadly, I live in an HOA, even though I'm out in the country, and it didn't work. So they just flat out said, that doesn't fit. It doesn't match your house. Go away. Ooh. Don't ask again. Oh, right. So, um, so, so, but the HOA rules basically say you can't have any structure unless it looks just like your house. So thanks for that. So here was my solution to that. Uh, there, there's a bunch of people that make uh, what's called Todd Morden Piers, and these were popular, popularized over in uh, uh, the UK somewhere. Uh, but essentially, all it is, you dig a hole, fill it full of concrete, bolt some cinder blocks to it, put a, a pier adapter on the top, put your uh, put your telescope mount on there, bam, you have a permanent pier for your uh, for your mount. So that was my plan. So I researched that. I talked to, or I looked at uh, this guy, Charlie Bracken's website. I actually talked to him and he he was gracious enough to let me use this photo for the this presentation. This is his setup. Everybody that does this says it's great. And I thought this was gonna be the way I went. So I, I uh, this was in November, early November. Um, I talked to my family that was coming out for Thanksgiving, my stepdad and mom and stepdad were coming out. So I talked to my stepdad and said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna build a, a pier for my telescope. It's gonna be awesome. And he, you know, he said, woo, let's do it. Um, I talked to my brother, bam, veto. So here's the deal with my brother. He owns a company that makes kind of high end or really high end metal work. So he does things like, you know, custom mailboxes, custom fire pits. Um, he has a, a laser cutter that can cut, I, I don't know, like inch thick steel. So, so he does all kinds of crazy stuff, a big, you know, a big fab facility and amazing design stuff. So he said, you know what, that's, uh, cinder blocks are not going to cut it. My brother's not installing cinder blocks. Um, it still would have been great. Don't tell him. But um, so he said, "Hey, let's let's work together. Let's design something, and we will we will do this right." So I sat down with with uh, Fusion, did some CAD work, um, and I came up with some brainstorms. This and I just did kind of a caveman design that's on the right. I said, "Hey, let's put a half inch steel plate on the top and the bottom. We'll build a basically a column out of quarter inch steel that will bend." Um, we'll have an internal wiring path, so a hole in the uh, bottom and a couple holes in the top. And then for the pier adapter, what a lot of people do on those Todd Morton piers, which works really well, is you can actually find, uh, and they're really cheap, you can find disc brakes that have exactly the same uh, millimeter hole size as the adapter on your um, on the bottom of your telescope mount. So all you have to do is find the right disc brake and they're 20 bucks or something on Amazon. And then you can bolt that to your, your Todd Morden cinder blocks 
uh, and off you go. But since we're making this a little better, I decided to go with the Ioptron uh, tripeer adapter. So I, I uh, designed in the whole pattern for that with the right offset for north. Uh, and that was the that was the way we're going to hook this column of metal up to the telescope. So I give him this. We talk over the phone, and he takes it and runs. He gets to work in his uh, you know his his giant shop of justice and comes up with stuff like this. So here he is doing CNC uh, bending of metal after he CNC laser cut it. And this this went on. He did it, you know many, many feet of welding to make this thing uh, happen. So he said, hey, we got it. Um, here's the whole pattern. Um, so we'll we'll uh, we'll mount it with this. Everything will be good. So once uh, once they all got out here for Thanksgiving, we had the all the guys went outside and we worked their tail off, tails off, mostly other people, not me, as you can see from the photos. Um, but my stepdad was out there. We we dug this big hole. My son uh, even had a good time with it. Uh, and then my brother uh, also. So we we laid about 500 pounds of concrete um, in this hole, which was about three feet deep, and it was maybe a foot and a half and at, you know square at the top. And in the bottom, we flared out um, just to make sure that um, that if there was any uh, you know ground freezing as the seasons change, that we kind of took care of of uh, it it moving. So um, big old chunk of concrete, and we recessed it about four to six inches under the grade of the ground, so that when I sell this house one day, we can just put dirt over the top and be done with it. Uh, and it'll just disappear. So this was uh, one day we laid all the concrete. You can see on the bottom right there we have the um, uh, we have the uh, the mount. So that's the the little plywood mount we made with the the bolt bolt pattern for it to bolt into. Um, and that's it. So that's kind of how we did it. So my brother gets here and uh, he unveils the pier. So this is what his pier looked like. Um, it's all steel, powder coated, uh, like I designed the bottom and the top are half inch steel and it's quarter inch everywhere else. And those pieces that you saw him bend a minute ago are what the, the walls are made of. So it's all welded together. Um, and then that Ioptron uh, tri-pier adapter is on the top. And the hole on the side there is for the wires to route, which I still haven't gotten to, but that's the plan. Um, so I posted this on the Slack, and of course Keith, who's not here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give him crap anyway. But he was quick to to name it the Monolith Pier, and so uh, for Keith, for uh, Keith, here we go. That's uh, that's <laughs> it. And we got conveniently once we once we put this thing in the ground, we got a similar picture uh, of it. So this was about 24 <laughs> hours after we laid the concrete. And uh, we put it on there. We didn't tighten the bolts yet. I, g I actually gave it almost a month before I torqued down the bolts. Um, part of that was because the weather was bad and I didn't care. But um, just to make sure the concrete was totally done uh, cooking. So that's that's that. Um, in that time, I, I designed a little 3D printed bracket to put all the power adapters. I have two power adapters, uh, one for my camera and one for everything else. So that's that's that thing hanging off the side. And then it's ready to go. So then, you know, now we had first movement. So now it's time for first light. So you can see here my first light wiring uh, cable management is ready to go. Um, the cool thing is, I you know, I hooked this thing up and I did some testing, you know, in the daylight in the shop. Uh, but once I hooked this up, I just hit go and it slewed pretty close to where, you know, to where it needed to go. And that was great. So um uh, so I did a, you know, did an alignment, did, you know, did the three star polar alignment and Nina got it as close as I could. And then, and then we did some testing. So uh, the first thing I, I shot was Orion because that's, that's easy and it's bright and that will let me see what's going on. So here's the gotcha though. So as part of uh, anything, so new board, like I said, this was the new hotness. Um, I found that they had an issue with it. So um, the picture looked pretty good. So I was pretty excited. And I thought I looked at my RMS values for the tracking, the guiding, and I thought eh, one, you know, one arc second RMS, it's not too bad. But if you look deeper, if you look at that graph, you can see <laughs> every RA correction is in the same direction, right? Yep. So what that led me down the path of is what you know what's going on. So it turns out, um, if you've done any electronics work, timers are hard, um, and the way the code was written. And the way the S6 control board is designed, uh, time wasn't real time, even with the GPS correction. So, um, so 
great thing is I, I posted online on the, the OnStep group. I posted up what, you know, everything I found. Why isn't this working right? This doesn't seem right. And Howard, you know, the lead guy there, uh, he fixed this thing in, in about two blinks. So it worked out great. And this is what it looked like maybe two days later. So then, you know, almost no corrections. Um, and so much, much better, much, much better activity, much better tracking and, uh, and all that. So uh, with all that fixed, that's, that's kind of where the electronics sit now. I've used it a lot since then, but, um, but this is what we're looking at. If we have good seeing, this is pretty typical for what I see, um, which honestly is, it's pretty great for a C gem. I mean, a C gem is not an amazing mount. I it's, I've been happy with it for the last 15 years, but it's, it's not a world-class mount by any means. Um, and to basically get auto guiding results that are, you know, in line with what seeing is, uh, or better than that's, I think that's great. So this is kind of what I'm seeing on a, on a good night. Um, the, the big thing is w when you have a telescope that's set up on a permanent mount in your backyard, it completely changes the game for, for doing astrophotography. It takes me five minutes to set up max. And that's if I pour a drink on the way out to the telescope. So it is it is really really great to be able to go out in the backyard, um, pull the cover off, and then turn a couple of switches on and be imaging right away. So uh, this is a picture from uh, a while ago, kind of right after I got it going. Um, before I would have never even thought to image the day after it snowed, right? Because you know you've got ice on everything, all that. But I I didn't have to realign. I didn't have to do any, do anything for this. I pulled the cover off, flipped some switches, and and did some imaging. So it's great. It's a it's a total game changer. Um, so just recently, um, my wife uh, did some landscaping work. When the landscape guys were here, they uh, made a path out to the telescope, which was cool. So this is just flagstone that they put in the ground, and then they uh, we put kind of or they put kind of a you know a rock area around. So all the areas that I had worn the grass down from me walking around it over the last couple of months, they uh, they covered it up. Um, like I said, this thing stays out at night, uh, 24 seven. This thing, I mean, this thing's been outside for, for several months now. This is what it looks like when it's buttoned up and ready for a storm. Normally I just put the cover over the top. I use a telegizmos 365. Um, and then, uh, I also have one strap that I'll put on if it's going to be windy or any of that. Um, if it's going to be really bad, um, then I'll put two, two straps on just to snug it down and make sure everything is, is great. Um, but that's it. it. I mean, it only takes a few minutes to get it ready to go, and then you can image, and it's it's been perfectly aligned every time. So it's it's been a huge win. Um, so back to the beginning, though. Uh, the really, I think the power in all of this is you can you can take a mount that is broken if you have one, or if you want to do a project, you can buy a mount that is somebody else's piece of junk trash, and uh, and make it a rock star. So. Um, I'm not going to lie. I've been looking for CGE pros ever since I finished this because you can get one that doesn't work. But the electronics are bad. I've, I've seen them for seven to a thousand dollars, 700 to a thousand dollars. And that's a, you know, if you put new electronics in that thing, that would be a, a great, great mount to have. So uh, there's all kinds of other mounts you could do this to, but uh, that is what I have done. So if anybody sees a CGE pro for cheap, let me know. Um, I told you I put links uh, and the files and all that stuff. I have a website that I update about once a decade. It's astronomynightly.com. So you can go there. I did a write-up. There's actually a lot more details on on all of this. Um, it's almost an encyclopedia of, of how I did this. So that's all there um, if you want to see that. And that's it. That's all I got. You don't have that's to listen great. to me anymore. What uh, what questions do you have? Well, in the spirit of uh, our, our MassFits group, thank you for that's what we do we share our knowledge we don't hoard it like the other guy we're not gonna mention his name <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh i i i just appreciate first of all it's a great interesting presentation thank you thanks Good. Uh, i do i do have a question and i if anybody else does uh uh just uh, the, the the peer did you polar align that once and you're done yeah so, so you don't you don't so, have a polar line anymore no so, so let me, uh, let me talk you through the steps. So um, let me, I might be able to show you, um, there's a, there's a photo this day. So let me go back to here. 
if you look on the bottom right two photos, there's that red line through there. Right. So what we did is we we designed the, the pier such that um, if you point one of the faces north, then everything aligns perfectly. Now you're not you're never gonna lay concrete to within you know an arc minute, right? Right. Um, but the cool thing is the mount's still adjustable. So we we at night we laid down this this um, it's just a piece of string, but we laid it down to align with Polaris where the hole was gonna be, and then we aligned the mount or bolting pattern to that. So that got us started, but that it just had to be close. Um, so that's the first part. The second part was doing a, pol a polar alignment like you would do every night if you were going to set up your scope every night. Um, I have used only the the Nina uh, plug-in three-star polar alignment routine, and I since since the mount doesn't move, since the pier doesn't move, I I tweak it in to get it under under an arc minute of uh, of accuracy and then I do a drift check in PhD to see how it does. So I do, I think I did an 18 minute drift. Um, so you can see any misalignment in deck, right? If if that's the case. But once I got it set, this thing with its, you know, huge slug of, you know, four or 500 pounds of concrete, plus the, the pier itself weighs about a hundred pounds. Um, and then all of that is bolted together and that's bolted to the, to the mount itself and it hasn't moved. So one of the, one of the questions I had was, when it freezes, is this going to, you know, jostle the the polar alignment? And it hasn't. So we, wow. uh, we I, deep enough. I right. Well, we yeah. So it, you know, if you look at if you look at the the local footing requirements and the code, they say for a deck, for example, you have to go a foot. Um, <laughs> but I figured let's go let's go way under that. <laughs> Concrete's cheap. <laughs> yeah, concrete. It's yeah, it's concrete's not that bad. We actually used. I didn't talk about it, but we used um, this fast setting quickcrete, which was super easy to do because it's actually made that you can just pour it in the hole, dry, and wow. wet it, and that'll be fine. So we we couldn't help ourselves. We still had to stir it, but they they say you don't even have to do that. You can just chunk it in there, and it's good. But um, but yeah, we we had a huge pile of concrete bags, put it all in there and. And I I have checked it, so I have gone back. I went back after a couple of months and checked it, and it, and you basically don't need a polar line again. Just wow. great. You know, it takes me five five minutes to twenty minutes. Yeah. And that's you're saving that every night. Every night. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't have to lug anything or move anything or, mm -hmm. yeah, any of that. So it's great. And, and did that mount you build it? Can you put more weight on it as a result? Well, so that's a great question. Um, you know, the C gem mount I have. I mean, almost a day one purchase of when that mount came out. My son is here, so say hi to my son. <laughs> um, um, and since the CGM has evolved, they came out with the CGM DX, I think, and the CGM 2, and they did increase the, the capacity of the mount or the rating of the mount. And I think they did that by, um, I want to say there was some electronics changes and there was a, a, a tripod change. So clearly, I have trumped their tripod, right? Um <laughs> So if the tripod was the limit before, then sure, you probably could squeak a little more out. Now, um, I'm I, I probably already was pretty heavy for a C gem, um, so I'm you know I was pretty happy with the results I was getting anyway. But it's been it's been good with it. Now I haven't pushed it. I haven't done a test to see how you know how much you can actually put on it. But um, I would expect it to help some. Definitely mm -hmm. not hurt. All right. Anybody else? Crickets. All right. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I was, well, I was just debating on this, get you over to my house and dig a hole for me. <laughs> <laughs> you your bro, that's a good looking, digging, right? that's a good looking pier. <laughs> it's, I, I love it. It's great. He, um, he did a, I mean, he did an awesome, an awesome job. Freddie actually talked about buying one from him. And I, I told him my brother would not entertain making any more. And then I talked to my brother about it and he said, well, maybe so. It's Freddie. You got to do it for Freddie. <laughs> well, that's what I told him. I said he would show up at your shop because he has, I think he has family in Houston. So my brother's in Austin. So he, Freddie said, I'll just show up. But um, I think, I think Freddie's spouse, I think his wife vetoed the pier once he showed. So similar to what my HOA did, uh, Freddie got the kibosh put on his, his backyard <laughs> pier, but 
but anyway, he's uh, my brother did say that if anybody wants one of those, then then uh, he would entertain it. He has a busy shop, so it would kind of have to be on a time available kind of basis. But it's I think it's a great pier. It's great. You can I mean you can go up and kick it. You know, you could probably drive a tractor into it, and it it's not going to budge. It's great. Excellent. No vibrations or anything with it. No worries with that. I haven't. I mean, no, I haven't seen any anything at all. It is. I mean, it is really really stout. In fact, we joked. Um, you know how you go to like the old park or the um, or or like an Air Force Base entrance and you see the fighter jet, you know, on a stick. We joked that we needed a fighter jet to to put on the thing. It's it's <laughs> it's seriously beefy. Mm -hmm. All right. And if anybody has to, uh, that, that a couple of uh, e, EQ6s are getting old. If anybody has any questions, <laughs> go to Brian. Yeah, the, I mean, the EQ6 and, and the CGEM are really close. So they're, mm -hmm. it's kind of a similar deal. I did just put um, these slides on the Slack if anybody wants them, if anybody Excellent. cares. So they're there, and you can share those if you want on the, the YouTube link. And put a link to uh, where you answer all those questions, if you will. Uh, where you you documented all this? Yeah, I will. I'll put a okay. link on there in okay, a minute. Thank you. All right. All right. Anybody else? Nope. Let's see if I can figure out how to stop sharing. There you go. Well, we're, we're about an hour and a half in, so I think this is a good place to close it out. Uh, Merrill says we can talk about gain and all that, but uh, we can do that another time. Uh, so uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming, and the Slack channel is your friend. Uh, it's amazing how responsive uh, MassFit's people are to answer questions. So if you have any issues, just drop a line. Thank you, Brian. You know, one thing, uh, Rick has a mount for sale. So that's an Orion Atlas. Yep. Right. Good mount. He's already tweeted. Hey, what, what about that? Is that something, Brian, that you could do? Is it, I mean, no. I would think so. An Atlas is a, I mean, that's a beefy mount. I don't see why it, not. It is, it's an EQ, it oh, it's an EQ6. It is a that heavy That was an mount. EQ6. Yeah, oh, it is. My okay. okay. Yeah, okay. It's, it is yeah I mean, it's in the same class then as as what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Forty pound carry. Weight. There's a lot of people that have done this with CG5 size mounts too. Um, but I, I mean, the ask. like I said, the guy that the guy that started this did it with his Lost Mandy mount. So there's you do it with whatever you want. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. I think that's a good place to end this, and thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you a lot, Brian. That was an excellent presentation. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, welcome. Hey, everybody, uh, have a great evening.